Hmm. Which game to play? Hmm. Kabuki Quantum Fighter on the Nintendo Entertainment. You know, what the f The tale of how Kabuki Quantum Fighter came to exist is a bit of a troubled tale. Creepy alien babies! It involves a marred existence of convoluted story ideas and a forced nature to be edgy and different. But would a convoluted story cause the overall experience to suffer? This review may be a curtain call for a title that has been ignored for far too long. So get ready. This is Kabuki Quantum Fighter. Kabuki Quantum Fighter was released in North America on the Nintendo Entertainment System in 1991 and in Europe in 1992. Now it's often a misconception that HAL, the Nintendo second party that created Kirby, Adventures of Lolo, and later the Super Smash Bros. series, was the developer. While HAL was merely the publisher of this title, the team behind this game was actually none other than Human Entertainment. This now defunct developer is responsible for the Fire Pro Wrestling series, as well as the famous suspense horror series Clock Tower. But before they became notable for these standouts, they created Jikogu Gokuraku Maru for the Famicom, which eventually was converted into the game better known to Westerners as Kabuki Quantum Fighter. Now there are some slight differences between these two versions in the same way that Shatterhand was different from Tokyo Shire Soru Brain. In order to bring in a western audience, the plot had to be slightly altered. In The Land of the Rising Sun, the game is actually loosely based on a movie directed by Kaizo Hayashi called Japangu. Also known as Japang, or Legend of Japangu if you're nasty. The movie, released in 1990, focuses on a samurai warrior named Jikogu Gokuraku Maru, who at one point in time dresses up like a kabuki during a fight scene. There's also a ton of really weird sci-fi-ish technology in a movie that was clearly based in an ancient Japanese setting. There was a ton of this type of movie making in the 80s and 90s, where the future was made out to be a distant place where anything was possible, and the bigger the fantasy setting, the wackier the journey would become. So, the Japanese game's name is the movie character's name, but get this, the game doesn't star the main character, it stars his descendant, Bobby Yano. See, in the year 2015, Bobby's World... ...has created a city that runs entirely on a computer system. Unless, someone can hack into something called the Psy Converter System and fix it, by dressing up like a kabuki. I don't know, give it to that Bobby guy. Yeah, yeah, he deserves a couple medals. So naturally, Western audiences weren't meant to see this version of The Legend of Japangu, at least in its created format. So human entertainment changed the plot and characters when they adapted it to a video game. Kabuki Quantum Fighter starts off with one of the most dull intro cinematics in the history of retro video games. Just try and keep up.
Boring, 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 boring. Boring, 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 boring. Boring, 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 boring. Boring, 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 boring. Boring, 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 boring. I mean, come on, not only is the music at this part dull and drab, but it's just so hard to care about two shots of the same thing over and over. I mean, compare this to this. You know, if you're going to use Ninja Gaiden type of cinematics, you may as well make them fun to watch. Just saying. If I judged my expectations at this point, I'd say this game is going to be a total bore fest. But believe it or not, the game remains relatively unscathed besides this awful and confusing story. But you know what, I'm a sucker for awful plots in video games, so let's see what else we can drum up. Kabuki Quantum Fighter's plot and characters are different by quite a large margin. You play as Colonel Scott O'Connor, a man who is 10 years older than his Japanese character's counterpart. Scott, or should we say, the lost Malcolm in the Middle brother, is Earth's only hope from destruction by the hands of a hacker who has taken control of a satellite called the Hyperion. There's a bunch of scientists who spend most of their time contradicting each other, saying things like, all hope is lost, then immediately afterwards just completely followed up with, unless the Colonel can get to level three, I mean that thing with that stuff that you have to destroy. Yeah. I talked about this in the Wolverine Adamantium Rage review back in Season 2. If you're going to bring story into the mix, make it immersive. I realize this is a Nintendo game, so things are limited, but even games like Vice Project Doom, an obvious ripoff of Ninja Gaiden in presentation, got it right. Don't make your story a set of goals to obtain. Honestly, and I hate saying this, but skip the story on this one. I'm a huge advocate for proper storytelling, and I think the player needs some sort of motivation or focus besides getting high scores. There's a level of separation between arcade-style games where story is unimportant, and games that try to involve the player like a good book or a movie would, because otherwise there's no point in making room for cutscenes. Speaking of cutscenes, check this out. When Scott becomes the Kabuki and gets loaded into the computer program, the randomized letters and numbers are actually part of the assembly code used to create the game. I guess the developers wanted to showcase their talents. Pretty neat. Alright, let's move beyond the story. There are two methods of attack. By pressing select, Scott can choose from a set of chips and weapons that get upgraded with each boss defeat, very similar to Mega Man. While the weapons do help with certain bosses, there's no real pattern to use them, so they become less of a focus. Then we have the main attack. Yes, that's right. Headbanging is the main attack. Your fiery red locks are your weapon in this game. Why this game decided to create a hero that headbangs is beyond me, but it creates a fun, frantic experience. When you mix the sub-weapons in for distance, it helps you become better at the game through careful thinking. Is it worth trying to attack certain enemies head-on, or hang back and toss weapons at them? You decide. While attacking in Kabuki Quantum Fighter is challenging and exciting, I actually had more fun with the platforming aspects of the game. In level 3, for instance, you'll run, jump, and climb your way through an obstacle course with very few enemies in sight. Though there are no fires or spikes chasing you as you climb, you may still feel like you should speedrun this, and that creates an interesting challenge. How can I get through this faster, you may ask yourself. Though Kabuki Quantum Fighter is far from a speedrun title, it gives off a sense of urgency as you play. Dear human entertainment, Stop with the annoying sound effects already! 
Why do developers have to toss in sound effects that make it sound like the world is about to explode? It's the sort of audible disaster that makes dogs howl and gamers lower the volume, which is a shame because aside from this noise, the game has some great sound effects and music. I really love Kabuki Quantum Fighter's soundtrack, which was written by Masaki Hashimoto and Takahiro Wakuta. To me, it gives off a Metroid feel to it. There are definitely some tracks that are higher energy than others, but the music is a strange mix between ancient Japanese instrumentation fused with sharp drums. The drums completely stand out here. They don't sound soft like Ninja Gaiden or full like Mega Man. They just exude a raw, electronic sharpness. The weirdness of these songs perfectly matches the environments that you traverse. This game has some truly strange imagery. From strange alien babies to pulsating hearts. For being on the inside of a computer world, these images seem less technical and more organic. I get the feeling they went for a weird mix between Contra and Ninja Gaiden's later stages, creating something altogether new and exciting. The enemies are just as strange, some of which even border on nightmare fuel. Controls are extremely tight, and everything plays and feels right in Kabuki Quantum Fighter. I would even say at points that things are a bit too fluid. Getting the jumping down can be a bit of a learning curve, very similar to the NES Batman game's wall jump mechanics. You'll need to play around a bit early in the game to see how you can maneuver your jumping, as it can prove to be disastrous. Though there aren't many pitfalls on the platforming stages, it feels fair when you fall as you don't actually die, you just have to work yourself back up to where you were and try again. After getting to the end of the game, a chibi form of Scott says we should look for him in his next game, which sadly never came to exist. Human Entertainment never revisited the franchise. But hold on. There sorta kinda wasn't really a sequel. Sorta. Kinda. Ish. The director of Zipang, Kaizo Hayashi, wrote the script for a PlayStation 2 game called Seven Blades, which is a loose sequel featuring the two characters from the movie, Jikogu Gokuraku Maru and Teppo Oyuri. Though the game never saw the light of day in North America, Japan and Europe saw it released to mediocre reviews. So I guess you can say the Japanese version of the Famicom game, which never hinted to a sequel, got a sequel. Whereas the American rendition saw nothing released. Strange. Kabuki Quantum Fighter is a well-balanced yet challenging game. Though the boss fights can be a little bit basic, the platforming and action mechanics work well throughout the experience. Sadly, you should give the story a pass on this one. It's not goofy enough to be ironically funny, nor is it bizarre enough to keep you intrigued. Every part of this game is weird and wacky, and that doesn't make it a bad game. In fact, it's quite the opposite. It's a great title. This one's okay in my book. Now, how about that sequel, huh? Somebody. Anybody.